name. Amen. Well, that is the goal today that we would make some more progress. We've been talking about faithfulness and you can write it this way in your notes. We've said faithfulness is simply what you do with what you've been given, what you do with what you've been given. In essence, what you do with salvation, what you do with what Jesus has provided for you and how you steward that will be reflected in your quality of life. That just because you've been reborn and you have a spirit now that is whole, that is sustained, that is free, that is flourishing in all of the provision of God doesn't mean that you will experience that outside of your life of faithfulness. And so we've looked at all these things with which we could describe faithful and we've been looking at right over the last month or so. And so um, I'll just review them quickly. Obviously, in order to be faithful, you have to be focused. In order to be faithful, you have to be responsible. You can't pass the buck. You have to be responsible. In order to be faithful, you have to live a life of reflecting, not perfecting. Remember, we talked so much about how perfecting literally becomes a put on. You're just basically putting on. Um, for um, in order to be faithful, you have to be thorough. You can't do things halfway. And in many cases, that's because we were in a rush. Um, we could be in a rush because we planned poorly or because we have things on our plate that have no business being there. Because if, if we can't do everything that we're doing as unto the Lord and with all of our might, because we ran out of might, then, then there might need to be some things that, that need to go away. Number um, five, we said in order to be faithful, you have to be willing to stand out. That that's not gonna bode well in your family, it's probably not going to bode well at work in a, in a worldly environment. Um, you know, our goal is typically to blend and not stand out. You have to be teachable in order to be faithful, and then you have to be right. And so, as we look um, some more at right thinking. I want you to consider this thought, and we're going to build from there today. Um, obviously, we talked last week about having two minds. Um, you have a carnal mind that's always at war against God, and it will never not be at war against God. Every single day, just like your hair has to be put in its place, you're, uh, if you're a lady and you put your makeup in place, those things have to be done every single day. Your mind has to be put in its place every single day. It's irrelevant how in control of your thoughts you were yesterday, today is a new day. And so your mind has to be put back in that proper place again today. And so as we look at this, we, we, you can write this statement down. You obviously have the mind of Christ, but do you use it? You have the mind of Christ, but do you use it? And so we want to kind of begin to unpack this thought today. Right is about a position. Right is about a position. Right is about a position. In Psalms 23, 5, David said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. But if you don't go to the table, then you're not going to benefit from what's on the table. So a position is required. We have, we have a responsibility. The ball is always in our court. What Jesus did, he did. And his work is finished, it's final. There's nothing left for him to do. As it pertains to your life, full provision has been made for the duration of your life. So we're not praying him into activity. We're not fasting him into activity. We're not working our way into activity. Everything that God is gonna do, he's already done. The last thing to be done is when he turns to Jesus and says, go get my bride. That's the next thing on his calendar as it pertains to the church age. So anything that I experience where we've, we've heard or we've discerned, you know, God is moving or God is working. No, I'm actually just, I'm actually just in position with what is available in him because God is always the healer. God is always the provider. God is always the deliverer. And so I'm not waiting for him to do something. He is this. But I can get in position 
of everything that he is. And, and I could interpret that as though he, by some, you know, all stars aligning, worked it out for me. But the reality is I got in position. I got in position. And every single day, if you're going to live a victorious and overcoming life, you have to get in position. The table is prepared for you. In Proverbs chapter 9, I really like these verses. This is um, verses 1 through 11 in the Message Bible. It says, Lady Wisdom has built and furnished her home. It's supported by seven hewn timbers. The banquet meal is ready to be served. Lamb roasted, wine poured out, table set with silver and flowers. Having dismissed her serving maids, Lady Wisdom goes to town, stands in a prominent place, invites everyone within the sound of her voice. Are you confused about life? You don't know what's going on? Come with me. Come on, have dinner with me. I've prepared a wonderful spread. Fresh baked bread, roast lamb, carefully selected wines. Leave your impoverished life. Leave, oh, excuse me, leave your impoverished confusion and live. Walk up the street to a life with meaning. Now, ultimately, thinking right, thinking God's thoughts, wisdom isn't just anywhere. It's not just anywhere. Wisdom isn't accessible to everyone. You must be in position. Truth is not available to every single person outside of position. The Bible says those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be fed. However, wisdom is advertising. Wisdom is calling out. In the core of every human being is a desire to know God. Now, it can be sedated. It can be filled with all kinds of other um, intoxicating things, whether it's the deceitfulness of riches, it's the cares and the worries of life, it's success and fame. But inside you, is we, we, we've said it this way, is a hole that only God can fill. And if you will respond to that hole, so to speak, the Spirit of God will lead you in a direction that will provide for you everything that you could ever need. But you have to be in position. Wisdom is not on the surface. Right thinking doesn't just come. But do you know what does come? Wrong thinking. Right? Isn't wrong thinking almost automatic? You had no intention to get offended. You had no intention to be bothered by that. Right. You didn't even know that you were mad. Right? Yeah. right? You had no intention. That, that thought of fear. You had no intention. Right? But if we're not intentional, the wrong thoughts will occupy real estate in our minds. We have to intentionally respond to the wisdom of God, which is found in His Word, and by relationship with the Holy Spirit, if we're going to think right. Now, now look at this table because we know nothing in the word of God is put here by accident. What is at the table? And this is Old Testament really giving us a picture of our new covenant thinking. Yes. This, is, this is wisdom in its highest form. This is what it is. I've prepared a wonderful spread. Fresh baked bread, roast lamb, and carefully selected wines. What is that? Revelation chapter 5 verse 12. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's Jesus. Wisdom is Jesus identifying with everything that Jesus has done. What is bread? What is wine? That's communion. What is wisdom? We see a foretelling of this. Even in the Old Testament, this is what it is. Wisdom is relationship with God. It's thinking God's thoughts. Right thinking is a mind fixed on Jesus. Right thinking is a mind fixed on Jesus. Not on your desires, not on your feelings, not on your to-do list, not on your abilities, not on your agenda. Right thinking is a mind fixed and stayed on Jesus. 
The lamb is there. The bread is there. The wine is there. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25? Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master Jesus on the night of his betrayal took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread, and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. What does this mean? This means that my life is about Jesus. And when I deviate from that bull's eye, yeah. I take myself off center. I'm vulnerable to thinking all kinds of wrong thoughts. And if my thoughts are off center as it pertains to who Jesus is and what he's done, I'm off love, which means I will be in fear. Anxious, worried, careful, selfish, all the things that are the opposite of love. Because the reality is, and, and you can look at it, uh, Acts, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up in the living while you guys go to Philippians because it's my favorite in the living. Stability in your life begins in your mind. It doesn't begin in your finances. It doesn't begin in your education. It definitely doesn't begin in, in a marriage relationship. You know, if you're single, well, if I was married, you know, then I would have more stability. But because I'm single and I'm by myself, but I'm telling you, stability is not in your relationships. Yeah, that's right. Stability is not found there. Yeah. Stability is in your mind, which is why so many people are unstable. So we have to fix your mind. Right thinking is, is a mind and a mindset fixed on Jesus. And not just Jesus, but everything that Jesus has done. He was slain, so I don't have to be. He went to hell, so I don't have to. He took on all sin, all shame, all pain, all guilt, so that I can be free. So what is Psalms? Um, I, I think I was, I was just looking at it. Let me, let me pull it up. Psalms 107, I believe. Psalms 107 too. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And you know your words will follow your thoughts. And so in Acts 20, 24, it's most familiar to us as it would say, none of these things move me, right? Stability is found in your perspective, in your mind. If your mind is stable, your life will be stable. If your mind is not fixed, where should your attention be fixed? On Jesus. That's where wisdom is. There is no wisdom for your life outside of first identifying with Jesus, you cannot get anywhere until, because guys, everything is in Jesus. Everything is in what he's done. You cannot get answers outside of a relationship with Jesus, which is why people are so confused in the church. It's why they're scrambling. It's why they're running from this ambition to this ambition, from this desire to this desire, from this vacation to this vacation, from this to this to this, because you have no wisdom outside of Jesus. He is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all wisdom. And until you first accept everything that he is and everything that he's done for you, you're, you're yielding to foolishness right off the bat. That's the central point. That's the beginning of all wisdom. Lady Wisdom has called out, and what have I got on the table? I've got the lamb, I've got the bread, and I've got the wine. Paul said, none of these things move me. Stability in our mind. I like it in the Living Bible. Life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. What is Paul saying here? I don't care what goes on around me. 
None of this moves me. None of this will hold my attention. And regardless of all the things with which I appropriate some time, as I'm raising kids, as I'm folding the laundry, as I'm doing whatever I'm doing, by your grace, let it be infused with the knowledge of your will, God. I see Jesus in all that I do. And if he can't be found in whatever that is, then I don't have time for it. I can't make time for it because if my mind is out of control, my life will be out of control. Paul said it this way, And the Amplified Classic, um, Philippians 3, verse 10, my determined purpose, my mindset is that I might know him, that's intimate, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving, recognizing, understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, that I may in that some way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. Isn't this what we saw in Psalms or in Proverbs 9? We saw the lamb, we saw the bread, we saw the wine. Wisdom never deviates, it never moves off redemption. Wisdom is rooted in redemptive realities. I can't tell you how many times Brother Hagin would say, you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to read the epistles, so the letters to the churches, circle, underline how many times you see in him, by him, for him, with him. We begin to identify with everything that he did. Why? Because that's where our victory is. Our victory isn't in our relationships. Our victory isn't in the the opinions of other people. Our victory isn't in our feelings. Hallelujah. Our victory isn't in our checkbook. Victory isn't found anywhere outside of the death, burial, and resurrection. Remember that, that I, I woke up uh, saying that, and then in, in our time with the interns, just death, where is your sting? That there is a way to live in such a way that I even have victory over death. That's right. That's right. It can't touch me. Yeah. It can't touch me. In Christ Jesus, I've already been delivered out of the authority and the dominion of the enemy. Yes. There is nothing. There's no fear. There's no terror. There's no destruction. Guys, wisdom is rooted in Jesus. And a mind that's not fixed on Jesus, a mind that's not focused on and centered on everything that he's already done and everything that he's done as it pertains to you will be unstable. It will be unstable. And if your mind's unstable, your life's unstable. Your mouth's unstable. Your emotions are unstable. And, and, We wrote it this way, Um, I think I put it in my notes, how you think affects everyone you are in relationship with. Everyone you're in relationship with. So if you think wrong about you, you know, I've been around people before and and, and you know what they're thinking. And it's stinking thinking. Because you know what it does? It like, it sets you back. There's, There's like this, I don't want to be closer to this. I want to keep my distance from this. Your thinking affects everyone that you're in relationship with, which is why it's not enough that we just come to church. It's not enough just that all of our household is saved. We have to think right. I can't tell you how many times Pastor Dean and Pastor Kathy would ask us, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Because if your thoughts are not focused on Jesus, if they're not centered on him, your life will be unstable. Your priorities will be all out of whack. We, we have sup- such a simple life. Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's real to the believer who's thinking about all that he did. Remember what Paul said, don't let familiarity with this breed contempt. Don't become so used to Jesus dying for you that you don't really realize that that affects your today. That affects whatever circumstance you're facing. Jesus already provided the victory for that. So your low level thinking is compromising your victorious position. Your life moves in the direction of your thoughts, right? 
And so he said, this that I might in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection and that I may so share in his sufferings, that's persecution. If you want to write it in your Bible, sufferings is always persecution. That's the only suffering that we endure. That's the only thing that he couldn't bear for us. Uh, aside from the suffering of your flesh, if you even want to call it that, but I don't, I don't think we want to really go there, but it's really the persecution, right? As to be continually transformed, continually in spirit into his likeness. Now this is in the spirit of your mind because in your spirit, you've already been conformed to his image. So this is in the spirit of your mind, which will manifest itself into every other part of your soul and eventually your body in, in the spirit, into the likeness, even to his death in the hope that if possible, I may attain to the spiritual, moral resurrection that fits me. There is a resurrection in Jesus that fits me. And every single day as I wear that, as I eat that, as I feed on that, then my life begins to manifest victory. But it all starts in how I think. And again, you know, Pastor Kathy's talked to us about this in, um, in Coffee with PK, but, but we also have heard it like we, we have to be thinkers. We have to be thinkers. We have to be willing to take some moments and acknowledge this is what I am thinking and it's wrong. Yeah. And however I've tried to justify it, however routine and systematic it has been for me to go here, that this is my go-to as it pertains to when someone treats me like that, my immediate response is, is insecurity. When this happens, my immediate response is this. My immediate response is this. Instead of, instead of staying in your place of victory, we have to think long enough about what you're thinking to take those thoughts captive and to reposition them. Which is why first thing, if just right out of, out of the bed, you take that place of victory. You begin to meditate, you begin to think about. You know, last night I took this coffee filter and I, I, in essence, marinated it. I had some, some lavender, and so I, I boiled the lavender in, in my tea kettle, and then I, I set this to soak in that lavender-infused water all night long. Now, I, haven't, I, have, I didn't make any coffee in this this morning because I don't have coffee on Sundays. <laughs> That's not my... Um, I'm telling you, if I had coffee on Sunday, we'd be through this notes and next week's notes. And like, that's just not that we'd be so talking fast. This is without coffee. So, so I don't, that's not my process. I have it as little as possible, to be honest, just because, you know, it's like the Energizer Bunny is like, you know, super powerful in my body. So anyway, but I'm almost positive that marinating in that lavender, as I would try to filter coffee through this, that now my coffee is super infused with lavender because that's my filter. Marinade, meditate, okay? So your meditations are your filter. Your meditations are your filter, not just the few hours that you spend at church, not just the few moments that you spend in your quiet time. Your meditations are your filter. You're marinating in your own thoughts every single day. And if you don't position those on Jesus, I wrote in my notes, life is all about Jesus. Everything in life is about him as a believer. And if you're not a believer, you'll spend your whole life without him. But that doesn't mean that your life still wasn't supposed to be about him. It was. Life is all about the Father because He made us, right? Now, think about lavender as it contrasts with coffee. They're two opposing forces. Lavender calms you down. Now, I haven't really experienced that. I have a little satchel by my bed of some dry lavender, and you're supposed to smell it, and it's supposed to calm you. I did, uh, I had a lavender and charcoal bath last night. I was really getting, getting into this today on you guys' behalf. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I can do all things through Christ. I can take a bath. I can take a bath. A lot of people take a bath. It's calming. I can do this. So I sat in there and I literally made myself be in there for six minutes um, because I, I forced myself because halfway in, I was like, oh my gosh, 
So I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, like, I can relax. I can do this. And, and it, it, at six minutes, I think it's a record for me. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll get more. But, but ultimately, lavender is supposed to have this super calming effect, right? Where coffee is supposed to have this super caffeinated effect, right? Build you up, charges you up, gets you going, right? We have a whole church full of lethargic people that are not getting up and getting going. They're discouraged, they're depressed, they're mad, they're insecure, they're frustrated, they're not fulfilled and they're not satisfied. For if we were brutally honest for some of the most shallow reasons known to man in light of the victory that Jesus provided for us, because we've been marinating in the thoughts and the ideas and the wisdom of the world instead of marinating in the wisdom that is only found in a mind that is fixed on Jesus. A mind that is fixed, that is set, which means I keep setting it there. I keep putting it back. In the King James, I like that, that it goes on in those same verses. And I'm going to pick up in verse 12, Philippians 3, 12, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. You know, I enjoy to say every single day, Father, I forget those things that are behind and I press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I forget those things that were former for behold, you are doing a new thing thing and it will spring forth speedily today yes. today it, and, and as many times as a thought from the past that would try to drag itself into my present I forget the former things for behold he is doing a new thing and it will spring forth speedily even now there is a newness that I'm in position for even now it says I press towards the mark of the high calling of God let us therefore as many be perfect or mature be what? Be thus minded. Yes. Be what minded? Be resolved that life is about knowing him. Yes. The past is no place for my perspective. And so this be thus minded. And if anything, you be otherwise minded. Meaning if for any moment you're deviating off this, let God reveal to you so that we can keep going forward. Let this mind be in you. What mind that I might know him? that I might know him, that I might recognize, that I might perceive, that there would, be a, there would be a meditation, that I would be marinating in the victory that he provided that now I have access to, the resurrection, not just his, but now mine. He's lifted me out of my past. He's lifted me out of three days ago. He set a new thing before me today. And I position myself because if he, if he wanted me to be victorious over this addiction, why wouldn't he want me to be victorious over this diagnosis? If he wanted me to be victorious over hell, so he delivered me to heaven, why wouldn't he want me to have heaven on earth? The victories for every day, the victories for the big problems or the large problems, the victories every single day. But if a church doesn't have have their mind fixed on Jesus they're all over the place and they're trying to fix it with their own ideas with man's wisdom instead of just stopping and saying okay where am I seated as it pertains to this where am I I'm always above it I'm always above it I don't care if it's stage five. I don't care if it's been in my family. I don't care if I've got so much debt I can't use a calculator to add it all up. I'm still above it all. And faith in God will bring me into everything that he's provided every single time. So let's think about him. Write this down and we'll close. When your meditations deviate from him, they have deviated from truth. That's right. So now you have a new filter. Have you guys ever told somebody the truth and they didn't like it? Yeah. They were mad. You're like, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> right? Why? It's because they're looking through a distorted filter. Yeah, so right? They're looking through a distorted filter. These verses in Proverbs go on to say that. We get a picture in Proverbs 1 
or Proverbs 9, 1 through uh, 6, about this meal, the lamb, the bread, the blood, wisdom calling. But verse 7 says, if you reason with an arrogant cynic, you'll get slapped in the face. You confront bad behavior and get a kick in the shins. So don't waste your time on a scoffer. Which means if you don't control your filter, you'll find offense with truth. And you'll perpetrate that offense on those who tell the truth. But all the while, you took yourself out of position, thereby compromising your access to his victory. Father, we love you.